Daniel Harris is with us next. He was creative producer on Busby, a new documentary feature film on the legendary Manchester United manager. That's next. Before Matt Busby, there were no football managers. I was born in a small mining village. The people were brought up in a faith which was football. I had no experience as a manager. All I had was certain ideas, faith in those ideas, and faith in the club. Matt was the first tracksuit manager training with the players. This was revolutionary. He had this aura about him. He made everybody feel important. The Busby babes, the way they played was rock and roll. Busby was trying to build the best club in the world. When you look back, do you think that there was any part of it that caused a sacrifice that wasn't worth it? Oh, yes. I woke up and I was in my seat, but I was about 30 yards from the plane. As the details seeped out, the magnitude of the horror became apparent. It hurts to think about it. My first reaction was never to have anything to do with football again. I had the feeling that I might have been responsible. I was terrified to come and look at the ground and feel the people. My wife said uh, the lads that have died would want you to carry on. And I got this obsession again. I still want Manchester United to be the best team in Europe. And the only way they can be the best team in Europe is by winning the European Cup. Mark showed the ability to knit a team. And it was an absolutely brilliant team. It was Matt's last chance to win the European Cup. He was like a father to us. You want to say one for him more than anything else. But nothing is more gratifying than to spot a star and see him develop year by year to his predestined place among the gallery of the immortals. Daniel Harris, good morning to you. Hiya. What was your involvement with this? Um, I was the creative producer, which could mean any number of things, because there was another creative producer, and we did very different jobs. But what I did was I did all the interviews that you see in the film, and then sat in quite a bit of the edit with uh, the director, Joe, and the uh, editor, Emiliano, just putting the film together, moving, moving bits around, putting bits in and out, that kind of thing. How did you get involved? Yeah. Yeah, it's like Dan. D Dan is finally in the movie business. Ha! Um, I've made I've made a couple of other films with this company before. Like I co-directed a film about darts, and uh, I was a consultant on Class of '92, which for World '73, the company that made this, also made. And um, so we kind of were talking. Had the idea was kind of germinated, and then wrote a proposal for it, and um, ended up luckily enough getting to make the film. Uh, quite daunting also, though, because uh, what happens if I balls this up? But well, hopefully we didn't. Yeah, exactly, because um, so many of that team are actually no longer with us, and it, we're just at the outer reaches of being able to make a documentary where there are proper eyewitnesses around who were part of a squad or a team, who saw the team play, who knew what he was like as a man. Like, this is kind of... After this, it's like in a book, and it's somebody reading a book about what happened at the time, and that's like the prism of three or four different voices already at that point so um kind of very late in the day but it's just just in time yeah i mean what we what we tried to do is we obviously tried to find stuff that people hadn't seen before because so much of this stuff has been seen loads of times and it's still great and feels great to enjoy it on a big screen also but you're trying to look for stuff that people haven't seen before you're trying to put it together in a way that hasn't been put together before and obviously there are people who it would be nice to speak to but you can't um because they're not around. So, yeah, there was a sense of in five years' time, ten years' time, it would be impossible to make this film. So it's an amazing story and a story that we felt like needed to be told in this way, on, on the big screen or in a cinematic way. And uh, that's, what we, that's what we tried to do, really, because, I mean, it lends itself very much to cinema because, ultimately... Cinema is about drama, is about love, about identity, all these grand themes, and they're all there in Busby's story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Martin Scorsese is definitely going to look at this and go, "This is real cinema. This isn't Marvel. This is <laughs> there's nothing cartoonish about any of this." 
um, it, why did you feel it needed to be made? That's like to, to go back to where the germ of the idea happens and, and certainly there are loads of books that people can read but it's definitely got to a stage in, in life now where people don't read books as much as they used to or certainly fewer people are reading as many books. Yeah, I mean, they're all, because there are, there are, there's one, Eamon Dunphy's book about Busby in particular, A Strange Kind of Glory, is, is a brilliant book. Um, but you can do different things with, uh, with visual media that you can't do with written medium and vice versa. And what we're able to do is we're able to show things and you're able to see the expressions on people's faces as they tell you about these things. And there are just little kinds of inflections. Um, I think I think it was in the bit that you just played there. There's just one of these bits in the film that always stuck with me when um, John Aston, um, who played for United in uh, the late, mid to late 60s, played the European Cup final in 68. So his dad played for Busby's first great team in 1948 and was a Marine prior to that. And so when, the, when he grew up in Manchester and when the tragedy happened, when Munich happened, his dad just went down to Old Trafford to see if he could help. And there's just this little inflection where he says, um, the magnitude of the horror became apparent. Yeah. And he just has that little pause and says, yeah. And then you suddenly, there's just something about it that you, that the way that he delivers the lines, the little boy who remembers this trauma that you can't capture in words. And you, what you get in a film is you also get to put together a load of viewpoints. So you get stories that people wouldn't really have thought about. So, uh, Ken Ramsden, who worked for United for years and was secretary, um, also the club secretary, um, his, his mum and her sister uh, used to work at Old Trafford washing the kits. And he talks about the fact that one, one week they're washing kits and the next second uh, they're polishing coffins. And no one was around to say, are you OK, ladies? Because that didn't happen then. And there was no one to be able to do that. And the way that he delivers that story, you wouldn't get that in a book in the way that you get it in a film because you're actually looking into someone's eyes. Same with Wilf McGuinness, who was injured, so he wasn't on the plane to Munich. And the way that he talks about that, again, you can only capture that either in person or on film because you're never going to be able to repeat, to quite relate exactly, exactly the feeling of seeing him do that. But there are lots of other things that you could do in a book that you, yeah, you get a lot more detail in a book because a book's a lot longer. You don't have to cherry pick. You can just put everything there. You don't really have to satisfy a dramatic structure in the same way to make it work on screen. But you can get a lot on screen by just getting to see people. I mean, you're seeing into their souls here. Do you, yeah. Do you, do you find, um, Daniel, that you get uh, nostalgic for the old game when you look at, you know, um, when you look at this movie and when, you know, you look at the socialism of Bill Shankly and um, I suppose Brian Clough to an extent as well. And a lot of these old managers came from mining towns uh, like Busby. And, you know, the players in those days were literally, you know, blokes that were on a on a decent wage or whatever and uh, it, it was a completely different time when um, you know I guess there were it was it was long before the days of the Premier League and that does it make you does it make you wonder about what football was in those days as Busby said it was sort of the religion of those of those working class areas um, I think it still is the religion of lots lots of people um, it's, it's interesting history because it does sort of make you nostalgic for a time you don't actually remember mm. Mm. and for a time that maybe even never existed so football was very different then of course it was but I mean one of the things about Busby is he didn't pay his players properly and he actually in some cases obstructed his players players getting paid properly so on the one hand the players weren't paid properly but on the other hand other people were making money off the backs of the players, and they didn't really resolve that till much after Busby. So, it's a, it was a simpler time, I would say. But there's a there's a sequence in the film where Busby talks about bringing in executive boxes, and then you see Busby talking about bringing Louis Edwards into United, and Louis Edwards got into trouble for selling condemned meat to schools, and his son Martin eventually sold United out to the Glazers. So, you. There'll, there'll, there'll always be things, is what I'm saying. There were definitely things in Busby's era that were better, and Busby was a great man, and Bill Shankly was a great man. But there were other elements that were, that were not so great. So, I mean, if you were kind, kind of picking, trying to build your ideal epoch of history, you wouldn't just go straight back there. You'd have a bit from there, but you'd also have a bit from now, where you see the best players are properly rewarded for being the best at what they do and giving millions of people thrills. 
I mean, that sounded weird, but you know what I mean. Um, give it a bit, providing us with this um, amazing entertainment and this amazing joy, the players are properly rewarded. And in Busby's time, you didn't get that. I, I wonder too how much of the impetus to make the film now comes from your view, and certainly a view that's widely shared, that there's this massive separation between the club ownership and the fan, the real fans of the club, and that actually a story like this re-centres everybody and reminds them that this is a club that has come through everything that it's come through. Um, well, it's like you were talking about religion, and um, all religions have their foundational myths, and the difference with your football foundational myths is they're by and large true. And so the stuff that you know about Busby, it's is, I mean, in some ways, it's absolutely ridiculous. What I would say is I, I've interviewed a lot of people, and I've never interviewed anyone who speaks about one person the way every single person speaks about Matt Busby. And you ask people what were his bad points. He didn't have any. And you kind of mull that over in your mind. And when you hear it from one person, you think, yeah, all right. But then when you hear it from also extremely hard men, who grew up in changing rooms, like if Paddy Crera tells you that someone doesn't have any bad points, you're inclined to believe him because if someone did have a bad point, Paddy Crera would be the first in the queue to tell them about it because he's a person who tells people things. Um, and it's very, and so to see Busby in, in that way, it's like it kind of almost feels like this guy can't be real and he's part of that foundational myth, except he is real because here is all this evidence about it. and. Um, I don't know if the film will be able to recenter people exactly because it's not going to change anyone's reality. And uh, the reality is, is that United still are where they are. But I think it is nice to to remember where you came from because if you and it does feel for a lot of people, definitely for me making it felt like family history because a group of United and anyone's football team will be in their life from from as soon as they can remember until the time that they die it's the only thing you can be sure of will be a constant you might like you have relationships that you think will continue but they might not people might die um you might you might get married you might get divorced you might change your religion all of these things might change but the thing that will always remain with you is your football team and there's nothing else that is quite at that level and often not always in football but often that football team will be passed down generations so speaking personally i've found the experience experience of getting to make the film quite moving and quite terrifying in some ways also because my, my dad passed United on to me and his dad had a season ticket at Old Trafford in the 40s and 50s. I never met his dad so I guess United would probably be the only, Old Trafford would be the only place in the world that we both frequented and it's very powerful that sense of heritage that permeates and percolates a life from the beginning until the end and that's how these foundational myths work, how these stories work. And so it's, it is definitely a very powerful thing. And film is obviously a very powerful medium. So hopefully the two of them fit together quite nicely and people watch the film. And not, not just people who support United, because it is a story not just about Manchester United, but it's a story about football. It's a story about tragedy. It's a story about redemption. It's a story about love. It's a story about the power of one man to do amazing things. And hopefully people see the film and feel some things, because that's ultimately what you're going for yeah. as a filmmaker, as a writer, you're trying to make people feel things. Yeah, no, totally. I want to play another clip. It's, uh, here's some Bobby Charlton. Have a look. All the players used to say, until you actually play in the first division, you don't realise how much you push yourself through pain barriers, which you never do in reserve team games. Bobby would say, I'm knackered, I'm tired. And my father would say, well, you're not going to die. Get running again. My right ankle was swollen up. And it was quite painful. And I hadn't played in the reserves for a few weeks. And he called me up to his room and said, I'm, I'm playing you in the first team tomorrow. If it was one time I didn't really want to play, it was that day. But I said, he said, are you all right? Is your foot all right? And I said, yeah, it's all right. And, and suddenly, the attention of the whole country was on Manchester United because they're playing babies. You know, they can't possibly win anything. Pleasant game is played in the sun, played in the rain, and the team that gets me excited. Manchester United, Manchester, Manchester United. A bunch of bouncing Busby babes, they deserve to be knighted. Wow, I've never heard that song before. That's class. I want to hear it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
Like, how, how much, like, yeah, how, the, the, the Busby Babes, how, like, was it, does it come across how unusual it was to put so much faith in, in young players at that time, which to me, it just seems extraordinary looking back. Um, yeah, we, um, Eamon Dunphy gave us, talked about this in quite a lot of detail about how it was revolutionary and the Babes were basically rock and roll. Um, and they, they knew exactly who they were. They were very kind of defined characters and no one had ever seen anything like that before. And Busby knew, Busby knew that if you could buy, if you could get these young players in, then you'd be able to meld them into what you wanted them to be and they'd be loyal to you. And I think for the people in Manchester, they saw young kids who were just like them, who were having a great time and also producing this brilliant football on a weekly basis. And they were... I mean, they were, they were a long way ahead of the other team. I mean, as it happens, had the crash not happened, the league was quite tight in, the, in that season in 57-58. They'd won the league by miles the two years previously. But, um, so the league was quite tight thereafter. But, yeah, there was, there was no one. There was nothing like them before. There'd never been anything like them before. And uh, it was a long time until we saw anything like them again. Can I ask you about the, uh, the modern team and how things are going at the moment, yeah. Daniel, just to, to wrap this up? Um... Yeah, you must. Things, um, things have improved a little bit. I mean, the last time you were on, they were just coming off the back of uh, defeat, but I made the point at that stage that with a young team like this, there will be these blips. So long as the trend is your friend, then everybody can at least have a little bit of buy-in. And it seems to me that Solskjaer's got things trending the right direction. And there will be blips along the way, but that the team are playing better football. There is an identity growing. There are relationships growing on the field. Some of the young players who are coming in are playing well. Things are vastly improved, I would say, than they were from the end of the Mourinho era and even the middle of the Mourinho era. Yeah, I think that's right. United have some good players. They're not, they're not a good team yet. But I think the game against Brighton was good, similarly to the game against Norwich, because what you saw was a routine disposal of a team that United should always beat pretty much every time. And they've, not, they've been making hard work of basically every, every point that they've won this season has been a struggle um, until this point. So it's, it's nice to see them actually playing some good football, looking like they're enjoying themselves. And the kind of game that you had been expecting from Brighton would be a much harder game than what it turned out to be because of the way that United play. But they seem to be finding ways to break teams down. And I guess now that he's more or less settled on a first 11 and a formation, you're seeing players growing in confidence. So even the players who, I mean, they're not of the quality that United come to expect, like Fred say. He's had a run of games, so now he's got some confidence and he's playing. You're seeing a much better version of Fred than you were seeing before, even if the best version of Fred isn't even the best version of Michael Carrick, never mind the best version of Roy Keane or Brian Robson. And what you're also seeing is you're seeing some of the younger players grow with, grow with playing more games. I mean, Brandon Williams has shown... There's nothing that we've seen from Brandon Williams that suggests he isn't ready to take Ashley Young's place. He's done well pretty much every game he's played, and now it's very hard for Solskjaer to drop him. And when those kind of things happen, it makes a, it improves the atmosphere, I'm sure, in the team, around the team, and in the ground. So I think that the game against Wolves, the game against sorry, the game against Bournemouth that United lost was disappointing because of the manner of it. United started quite well, didn't score early on, and then became discouraged very quickly, and uh, quite quickly went from okay to not all okay. But if you look at the general picture of the last six weeks, or whatever it is, it's actually United are starting to play quite well. And they definitely have the attackers to hurt any team if they can find a way of playing through midfield to get them the ball. And that seems to be improving. It's, it's, it's one thing, though, about the Manchester United fans I found, Ger, that, um, and uh, I don't know, you'd know this better, Daniel. I, it, throughout the, you know, the three or four managers that they've had, obviously, since uh, Fergie, so, what's that, four managers, um, the, the fans have been incredibly patient and they've been very, very slow or reluctant to get after the manager, which would not happen at other clubs, particularly around the continent, but also in England where they, you know, a club so accustomed to success that became pretty crap very quickly um, and was underperforming. The fans just, and I know it's a little bit different with, with Oli, but they seem to have this kind of strange patience and understanding that um, this thing needs time. And I, I definitely, I, I find it quite interesting in that regard. Um, I think that it depends on the circumstance. Like what I th it seems to me like you've seen with Moyes, Van Gaal and uh, Mourinho is that the fans turned when the hope ran out. So it gets to a point where you look at what's going on and you realise that it is never going to happen under this manager. What you want to happen is not going to happen. And at that point, more or less, the manager, 
the manager's position became untenable. So Van Gaal actually, his position became untenable about four months before he actually ended up going. But more or less the others, that was when that was when they got fired. Once it became clear that there was nothing they were going to be able to do. Uh, and the thing with Solskjaer is people are patient because he's him. And also because he's a young manager and he needs to learn. And anyone sensible understands the constraints that he's operating under uh, financially. So I think that there are a lot of people that think he was the wrong person in the first place. And there are plenty of people probably that think he's the wrong person based on what we've seen so far. But there are also a lot of other people who can see that things are going in the right direction. He's brought in some good players. He's got rid of players who may have been good, but who you would be unlikely to win the Premier League with. And as long as people can see that there's a plan and they don't run out of hope, then it doesn't really make any sense not to not to back the manager in the ground because you want the team to do well. And also, let's say United, let's say United fired Solskjaer tomorrow. Who would they then go and get who you know will definitely succeed? And no one really knows the answer to that question because succeeding in any football manager's job is extremely difficult. Um, maybe the best two managers in the world currently, man Liverpool and Manchester City, so you're not getting them. And then if you fired Solskjaer, who would you go and get? And so people really want Solskjaer to succeed. And so it's, people are happy to give him the opportunity to do what he needs in the same way that they gave other people who they felt no emotional attachment mm -hmm. to time to see if they could do it. Because everyone knows that it took Alex Ferguson a long time to get there. And the game is different now. And, the man, and Alex Ferguson had done amazing things with Aberdeen. But you, you can't, it's pointless saying, well, it's definitely not going to work because of what I've seen in the last three months because that's not how life works and like it would be very it'd be very simple and very simplistic to think that a dodgy start to this season tells you that Solskjaer is not good enough so but, if, he, if, yeah. he, if he doesn't make the Champions League though like is that what he has to do so I'm looking at the table here they've got 16 points Man City have 25 Man City are fourth so nine points off fourth at the moment it's a big gap to, not impossible but the way Leicester and Chelsea are playing at the moment you know you wouldn't expect them to drop too many points um it's only nine points head start from uh, a quarter of the season gone or a third of the season gone at this stage. What 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 would be acceptable now for the rest of the season for Solskjaer? Um, I think that if United don't make the top four, they won't fire him if you can see that there's signs of progress and if things are going in the right direction. So if United go on a good run from now till the end of the season, but Chelsea and Leicester don't drop, then you wouldn't you wouldn't fire him for that. Whereas if they end up finishing twelfth and it's rubbish. Yeah. then you would obviously have to think about firing him very seriously because United shouldn't, however many injuries United have, they shouldn't be finishing in that position. And the reason why they are where they are is mainly, I think, because they, they drop points. Obviously, they drop points where there were those games where they were leading. And if they just hung on, they, they, lost, they lost the lead to Southampton when Southampton had 10 men. They lost the lead to Liverpool. They lost the lead to Arsenal. They lost the lead for Wolves, to Wolves when Wolves basically played well in the match for five minutes and scored during them. So it's easy to look at United and say that they're rubbish. And, and it's true to say that they are. But if you actually look at the games that they've played in, there have been enough games, I think, that we've seen so far this season where you can see some signs of progress and feel that, on a different day, they might have actually got the points in those games. And that won't be good enough in six months' time because you need to have seen improvement from August to set, from August to May. But if you do see that improvement between August and May, then I think it would be fine to give Solskjaer another season and some more money to buy some more players to see what happens. Yeah. Uh, because, it's, it's, as I said before, the, managers, the previous managers have been fired when the hope has expired. And whether or not the hope has expired won't necessarily be contingent on league position because if United win the last 10 games, let's say, but it's not enough, then you would say, OK, something's happening. OK. Um, is the movie Busby getting a cinema release in Ireland? Uh, it's not getting a cinema release anywhere for reasons with which I'm not familiar, it not being my department. Um, it is available on uh, DVD and Blu-ray and all these other names of things. From November the 15th. November the 15th. All right, well, best of luck with it and congratulations on it too. Cheers, lads. Thanks a lot. All right, take care. That's uh, Daniel Harris giving us some thoughts on the new movie Busby, which is available in three days' time. And uh, We need to see it in the cinema. Yeah, it'd be good. We should... DVD and Blu-ray, is that even a thing anymore? Yeah, I presume it? it's also streaming places. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, would, it, would, it is great to watch like a football uh, film or documentary in the cinema. Yeah. It's quite a, quite, a, quite a lovely experience. Maybe we could try and get a screening together. That might be something for us to work on.